Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Hey there, podcast listeners. I just want to say at the outset of this episode that I love being a social worker. I'm proud of my profession with all of its imperfections. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but in case you're not a social worker and you stumbled across this episode on Stitcher or iTunes or even the web, let me just say that social workers are everywhere. Social workers are in government, politics, hospice, early childhood intervention, schools, primary care, criminal justice, and yes, child welfare. And if you're in the United States and you go to see a psychotherapist, you're most likely to see a clinical social worker. You know, we provide more mental health services than all other helping professionals combined. And yet, despite the fact that we're on the front lines and behind the scenes, we're mostly invisible in the entertainment and news media. And when we do show up in the news, it's rarely good. I personalized my Google News feed to pull up stories with the phrase social work and social worker. Turned out to be a little masochistic. Headlines were, as you would expect, misidentification of child welfare workers as social workers, reports of actual social worker misconduct, the occasional death of a social worker, and then the very rare time where a social worker won an award. Now, I know, bad news sells. If I want my news to look on the bright side, I gotta head over to happynews.com. But it wasn't the absence of positive stories about social workers that was distressing. It was the absence of stories where social workers were the experts. Looking at social workers as the source of bad news rather than the group of professionals who can provide insight into why bad things happen and what society can do about it has implications beyond my self-esteem as a social worker. This view of social workers as incompetent and social services as flawed or dangerous has serious consequences. It affects the public's belief and attitudes about social welfare issues. Does this sound familiar? You talk to somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I read that story about homeless drug addicts get free housing. I should have thought of that one. It gives potential consumers a negative view of service providers. How about this? Does this sound familiar? Oh, so you're a social worker, huh? You going to take my kids? And it can also affect how our colleagues see us. Well, you know, it doesn't look like this patient's ever had therapy because she's only been seeing a social worker for the past year. This isn't anything new. In 1997, the former executive director of the National Association of Social Workers, Josephine Nieves, said, Little troubles professional social workers more than the less than accurate image the public seems to have of our profession, acquired unfairly and based on misinformation. Now, social workers in the United States, in the UK and Australia and other countries have been responding to this image problem for years. In the USA, the National Association of Social Workers regularly pursues media awareness campaigns. NASW recently set up the website socialworkersspeak.org explicitly to give social workers and the general public a place to critique and improve the way social workers and social issues are covered in the news media and portrayed in the entertainment industries. And to put a spotlight on news and entertainment media that did a good job of portraying social workers... In 2012, NASW gave out media awards to websites, films, columns, and movies. Now, full disclosure, the Social Work Podcast won the 2012 Media Award for Best Website. So, all this is great at an organizational level. But what can we do? What can you and I do as individual social workers to change the way social work is portrayed in the news and entertainment media? Now, NASW has some recommendations, which I'll read in a minute, but I wanted to go to the source to talk with a real live journalist about this issue from a journalist perspective. After all, they're the ones reporting the news. So today I'm talking with award-winning journalist Mike and Scott from Philadelphia's public radio, WHYY 90.9 FM. I met Mike in a number of years ago because she interviewed me following the suicide deaths of a couple of high school students in the region. Since then, when there have been youth suicides or when issues around cyberbullying and youth suicide come up, Mike can give me a call, and I've been on the radio a couple of times. 
So I know that she does a really good job at talking about the issues in a way that social workers can respect and in a way that I think does a good job for the public in terms of education and information. Here, just take a quick listen to some of her work. With three suicides at Interborough High School, along with a wave of suicides at Cornell University, parents and teachers are concerned about suicide clusters, a suicide in a person's but should avoid big memorials, which could glorify suicide. I'm Mike and Scott, WHYY News. The study surveyed 400 school social workers and found that half of them felt that they were not prepared to deal with the issue of cyberbullying. Kids need to be trained to alert adults when cyberbullying occurs. I'm Mike and Scott, WHYY News. In today's interview, as a way of setting the stage for how the news works, Mike starts by describing what she does a day in the life of a reporter. She talks about how she finds experts to interview. We talked about how social workers can combat this misperception that we're the same as child welfare workers. Again, just know that I'm not dissing my colleagues and friends in child welfare. Um, She encourages social workers to become advocates for their own profession. She points out that psychology, medicine, and nursing get all sorts of information to reporters on a regular basis, but social work does not. She talked about what she looks for in a good interview, and we ended with Mikan's ideas for how social workers can influence the stories that are heard in the media. So I promise we're going to get to the interview in just a minute. But as you're listening to the interview, I want you to think about what can you do at the end of this interview? What can you do over the next week to engage with a reporter, a journalist, somebody that writes a newspaper article, somebody that is in the business of news? What can you do to reach out to them and to help them do a better job of both representing what social workers do and also becoming a resource for them when they need expert interviews? Now, the National Association of Social Workers has 10 recommendations for engaging media professionals. So I'm going to read these, and I want you to think about which one of these you could do. And then at the end of this podcast, I want you to do something. I want you to spend the next week, you know, doing your job, living your life, but also thinking about what can I do and reaching out. Okay, so here they are. Number one, add three social issue reporters to your contact list. Two, send a thank you note to a journalist for a good story. Number three, introduce a social work expert to a reporter or editor. Four, participate in a print, radio, TV, or online media interview. Five, post a comment to a media website or write a letter to the editor. Six, invite a local media person to MC an event. Seven, alert a columnist about a new social work research report. Eight, Produce and place a PSA on a local TV or radio station. Nine, invite a journalism student or professor to a social work class. Number 10, ask a working journalist to join a nonprofit board or advisory group. So again, this is my challenge for you. Do one of those things in the next week. And when you do, go to the Social Work Podcast Facebook page and leave a comment about what you did and how it worked. You can go to socialworkpodcast.com and leave me a voicemail using Google Voice, and I'll put you on the air. Okay, so without further ado, on to episode 77 of the Social Work Podcast, Social Workers in the Media, an interview with Mike and Scott. Mike, and thanks so much for being here and talking with us today on the Social Work Podcast about social workers in the media. What do you do? So I'm a radio reporter, so I work at WHYY in Philadelphia. I also do occasional television stories, but mostly my job is in radio. I'm in the newsroom, and I have the luxury of actually having a beat, which is something a lot of journalists don't have anymore. So I'm part of the health and science desk, and my specific beat is mental health and behavioral health. So it is really great because It allows me to focus in on stories, to get to know my subject matter, to get to know the major players and the research. Many journalists are what's called a general assignment reporter. So they come in. Every morning, typically, an organization has a news meeting. So the reporters say, hey, I think this makes a good story and this. And then the news director says, well, that's great, but you know what? (laughs) I have to send you to City Hall. Or there is a child that has been found and was mistreated. So you have to 
cover that. Or you have to cover violence in school. Whatever is on the calendar that day, you have to go do it. And that means you have to get to know that topic in a hurry. So when you say in a hurry, what's the time frame? Well, usually you come... You come into work in the morning and then you have your news meeting and you are expected to turn that story around by the end of the day. If there is a six o'clock newscast, that's when your story is supposed to be ready. If the paper is coming out the next day, you're supposed to write that story. So you're getting on the phone, you're calling people, you're searching online and you're saying, can you tell me anything about this? So it's it's about getting a lot of information quickly. And then the other thing is, it's about who is available to talk to you in a quick turnaround time. There might be a great expert, but if you can't reach him by three o'clock, then too bad. So how do you know who the great experts are? How do you know who to talk to about a story? Well, the problem is a lot of times we don't know. So we, we go in, we research, we read what other people have already written about this. We think, okay, who might know something? I mean, the, the way I found you was I was looking into the issue of youth and suicide. So you had written about it, and that's how I found you online. And I thought, okay, well, here's somebody who has researched this. Let me talk to him. So we try to do the best job of finding the people who have spoken and talked about it. But a lot of times, if we don't know a certain aspect of the story, we don't even know what to look for. So I think one of the things that's uh, most contentious for social workers is this misrepresentation of social workers as child welfare workers by the media. What would you recommend social work as a profession do to fight this misperception that social workers just go out there and take kids from their parents? Well, I think first it's important to understand that when things go wrong in media coverage, it's usually not malicious. It's not the media sitting down at the media desk and writing stories to, to put down a profession. I'm sure a lot of journalists are not entirely sure of all the things that social workers do. When we do interact with social workers, when we hear about them, it typically is in the context of you know, child abuse, child maltreatment, and all of those things, social services. So when do we hear about this? When things go wrong. When things go right, we don't hear about stories when things go right, because there is nothing to report on. So my advice is this. A, if there's a story that you dislike, that you feel misrepresents what you do and your profession, write to that person. You have to let them know. And I'm usually very grateful when I'm hearing from people. And if they're telling me, hey, you got this wrong, fine, thank you, then I'll do better the next time. And people on the other side are usually incredibly astounded when I email them back and I say to them, hey, thank you, okay, here's what happened, or here's what I didn't know about. So then we have a relationship. And often they develop into somebody I can then call on. So I didn't set out to do a bad story. It was just that I didn't know. So my number one advice would be when you read something, when you hear something and you don't like it, write to people, email them. You can find them on Twitter. You can find them on Facebook. Everybody is everywhere. Let them know. You know, just you don't have to berate them. Just say, look, I'm, I'm kind of upset because I feel like this is always wrong. Well, and it seems like, you know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking that it would be important for social workers in any community to know who is writing about topics that social workers would care about. Child welfare is one of them, but also things like social service treatment, uh, Medicaid billing, uh, all, all these all these sorts of topics. And that could be a variety of folks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, most of you read the newspaper, watch the news, so you know who's kind of reporting on these stories. Sometimes journalists, if they don't have a beat, they have a certain story that they follow for a while. So you know who is doing the reporting. And even if you just come across a report on the internet, you can look up who wrote it. It's right there. It says it right there. And you can get in touch with those people. So that would be the one thing to do. The other thing is, I feel as a profession... Social workers could be more proactive in terms of getting the word out about what it is that you do do. So tell me, you know, let me ask you, like, name one area of life where social workers are not involved, really. Um, you care for the I don't, Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we're, we're in every facet of life. Absolutely. Right. So I feel that you should be more proactive in terms of getting the word out about this is what we do. 
and here's what we stand for. That means maybe your national organization becoming more engaged in taking a stance on political things, on big issues of our day. I don't hear from social workers. I hear from psychologists. I hear from the APA. I hear from doctors and from nurses. They all have professional organizations who are getting me stuff. And they say, hey, you should cover this. And we as journalists, we typically love to hear from the people on the ground. So we love it if a social worker or anybody or a nurse who is out there doing the work and you take the time to email us and you say, look, I think this would be great to cover. And a lot of times we actually do it because you know what's going on. We don't. And we don't often have the time to really delve into the issues that you see every day. And you could just break it down to us. Okay. So I'm imagining a social worker who works at a hospital or maybe an outpatient community mental health clinic. And they have what they think is a great story, but because of agency policy, because of confidentiality, because of all of these sort of constrictions, um, boundaries, they can't actually either talk on record or talk in specifics. So what would you recommend for a social worker that wanted to get a story out there but, but was constrained? Okay, there is many ways around that. So first, if you have a, a good story, you can email or call a person, a journalist, maybe somebody whose work you've seen and you, you trust. So you, you can call them up and you can say, look, here's my idea. And I think this would make a good story for this, this and this reason. I would like to talk to you. But this would have to be what we call off the record. If, if it's something where you're really concerned about your job security and all that. So you have a so-called off-the-record conversation with a journalist, and we all respect that. So we're not going to go back and say, hey, Jonathan Singer told me. <laughs> so we won't do that. So we will find a way around it and then come basically back to the organization where you work and say, look, I'm interested in this topic. How can I cover this? So your name will be out of the equation. However, in many cases, the situation is not that delicate. You're not being a whistleblower. You just want to bring attention to an issue that's important and important to your work. So you could either talk to your you know, talk to the journalist first and then ask the journalist to contact your agency and ask if they can interview you. Or you could go to your PR person and say, look, I have this idea. Can we do this? So there are ways around it. And when it comes to client interviews, sometimes, you know, we would like to shadow you as you do your work. And that's very difficult. But we're used to working around that. So sometimes there is maybe a former client who is now willing to speak or there is somebody who is a client but says, that's fine by me. You guys are helping me. You can follow me. So there's always ways around that. Is there a code of ethics that journalists have? Social workers have a code of ethics. It's a huge deal in our profession. Is there a journalist code of ethics? Is there something that, that, that guides what you do? Yes, there is. And we, we talk about that in school. And I think each person, we don't talk about it so much maybe here in the newsroom because it is assumed. So we don't burn our sources. That's for sure. I mean, that's I would say pretty much unheard of. So if I've made a personal promise to somebody, what we say will stay right here. I'm not going back on that. And I think you would be hard pressed to find a journalist who will do that. So you can usually you can trust the person, especially if they're respected and they write for a bigger publication, you can trust that they will respect your wishes and what you've asked them to do. You can always ask those questions before you go in. You could say, hey, here are my questions for you before we start talking. So this idea of the interview, I think this is also interesting. Let's say that we get something to a reporter and they're interested in covering it and then they say, okay, so let's interview you. What, what sort of things do you look for in a good interviewee or a good guest? I like people who, who tell me what it's like on their job. So give me examples. You don't have to name people, but you can talk about what it is that you do and you can give me examples. So be descriptive. Tell me what your day is like. What are some of your biggest challenges? If you know some statistics, that's great. But we always have to bring the story to life with examples and with with real people and real stories. That's what makes it good. The other thing I would recommend is before you sit down for an interview, if there's something that is really important to you, tell the journalist what that is. So let's say you feel that 
people who smoke. Let's say you're a social worker who counsels people on on smoking cessation, and you feel that it's always the one thing the media always says is X that people who smoke are this. So. Tell the person, like, look, it's really important to me that we make this and this and this clear. And if you if you say that right off the bat, then we will try harder to make it to make that clear. It's so interesting hearing you say that because it it makes it sound like more of a uh, collaboration. And I think the way that I usually think about the media, and I suspect others listening to this, is that in, like the media is its own thing. And then we just sort of have to passively um, consume it or accept it. No. I mean, think about you. You have become the media in your own way. So you started your own podcast. That's great. I mean, the traditional media is all going to go away because people are not tuning into radio stations. They're not tuning into TV stations. People get their content from what we call sideways entry points. So they get their content via social media. They seek it out themselves. Everybody is their own media director. So the traditional media are losing power each and every day. So You can become more savvy in terms of getting your own story out there. People like me are more accessible than ever before. You can call me out on stuff on Twitter if you want to. On Facebook, you can say, hey, you did this horrible job. So if I don't respond to you via email, which I would, but, you know, you have more power than ever before to get your story out. And you should take charge of that. Okay, so I, I think this is so important because this idea of taking charge of the story. Who was it? Marshall McLuhan with the, the media is the message or the message is the message. I won't put you on the spot to, <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to like fill the gaps in my knowledge. Um, given that we're all our own media directors and by extension, social work agencies and organizations are their own media directors, what should the profession do to improve Uh, the view of social work in the media and also to get out stories and just kind of to shape the media representation of, of what social workers are doing out there in the real world. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really great if more positive stories came out, which that is a, a problem for every profession, because what do we hear? We hear about the terrible mishaps that that's not specific to social workers. But I do think, for example, I feel psychologists have done a really good job of inserting themselves as the experts. So they weigh in on a lot of news-related topics, on topics that are not kind of pathology-driven, but just have to do with everybody's everyday life. So you hear psychologists weigh in on work stress and on work relationships and on managing your career and your relationships and all that. Social workers can do all that, but we don't hear from them. You know, we hear about them as this downtrodden group that doesn't get paid enough money and works all these terrible hours and then something goes wrong and, oh, it was the social worker's fault, right? <laughs> That's kind of what we get. But I think, okay, so my, my strategy would be this. A, call people out on stories and say, look, I know that something went wrong here, but there's another side to this. Or how about we could talk about this? B, Get your expertise out there. When you have a point, when you want to take a stance on an issue, take a stance and take it nationally via your organizations and get your opinion out there. Offer yourselves as experts on different topics that are seasonal, that are important. People like you, you just put yourself out there. That was great. So there you are. And other people can do that too. You know, you could, you could write editorials about your work, about the people you've helped. I'm thinking StoryCorps on, on NPR, you know, those kind of relationships. We need to hear the side of the social work profession, the incredible helping you bring about. That's, I feel, the part of the story we don't hear. I have this fantasy that schools of social work will start to include um, a course on getting your story out there, you know, because I think that's one of the problems. Like we have, we have such a focus and, and it's, it's not a problem what we do, but because we are so overworked and under-resourced that we, we, we spend all of our time and energy uh, just trying to get it right in our jobs. And then when we're done at the end of the day, like the last thing we want to do is to think about or talk about or do anything with our jobs. But then it does. It, it leaves the psychologists, it leaves the nurses, it leaves the doctors who are framing the conversation mm -hmm. around what helping professions actually do. Right. 
And I think there are small things. You don't have to do big things. But if you write an editorial for your newspaper or for your favorite website, if you are on Twitter, a lot of people are doing fact of the day. For example, mental health people do that to reduce stigma. So, Or even if at your next Pennsylvania Social Worker Association meeting, you spend an hour talking about how can we frame the conversation? How do we get our message out there? That would just be a start, right? That would be a huge start. And also, again, you know, see yourself as somebody who can and should interact with the media because the media is people just like me. It's people. Is there a journalist association that, say, the National Association of Social Workers should start having conversations with? I'm thinking in terms of like you and I can talk, right? And I know you and I can email you. But then I'm thinking about sort of – how the sort of the big professional organizations get involved in this. Is that something that would happen organization to organization or is it really individual relationships? I think the best way to go would be individual, you know, individual relationships, talking to people, finding the people whose work you like and seeing if you can kind of reach them on a personal level. My last question. How did you get involved in doing behavioral health stuff? It was that luck of the draw. <laughs> I was a I I'm a journalist by training, so I went to school for journalism and then just happened to find a job that was related to mental health. So my first job with HYY was producing Voices in the Family. And then when this reporter job opened up, they thought, "Oh, that would be perfect." So the the behavioral health I I've, I've always found it fascinating. I mean, it's a totally fascinating topic, but it was not something I sought out. I could have ended up reporting on poodles or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then it would be the best in show that's podcast, right. right? Okay. That's great. <laughs> Mike, and thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today about social workers in the media. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm Jonathan Singer, and thanks for being with me today for another episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode or have suggestions for future episodes, please visit socialworkpodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our online store at cafepress.com slash swpodcast. To all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you next time at the Social Work Podcast.